take a good look at this. India. You probably think of it as a country or maybe a subcontinent. But what if I told you it's neither? What if I told you India is a geological fugitive, an ancient island that broke off from Antarctica and went on a high-speed joyride across the planet, smashing into Asia at twice the speed of anything we see today? It was a journey of over 6,000 kilometers, a continental demolition derby. You think I'm kidding? That collision is the only reason India exists at all. It's the reason for its rivers, its climate, and its people. And the story of how it happened and why it was moving so impossibly fast is way crazier than you think. Stick around, because this is the real origin story of India. Okay, so hit the rewind button, like way back. We're talking 140, maybe 200 something million years ago. And you're looking at a map that just doesn't make sense. You've got this massive supercontinent called Gondwana, which is basically all the bits of the Southern Hemisphere squished together. And India, it's not this nice peninsula hanging off Asia. No, it's this chunk of rock wedged right in there between Antarctica, Africa, and Australia. Yeah, Antarctica. Now, supercontinents, they don't last. They're like a band that's doomed to break up. And around 120 to 140 million years ago, that's exactly what happened. Gondwana fragmented. In the late Cretaceous, around 100 million years ago, India finally split from Madagascar, becoming insular India. India, still stuck to Madagascar at this point, breaks off and starts floating. It's an island, a big, lonely, insular India. And we know why it's moving, right? Tectonic drift, the slow, steady churn of the Earth's plates. But here's the thing, there's a problem, a huge problem. When it first broke off, India was moving slowly, about five centimeters per year. You know, a lazy drift. But then, around 80 million years ago, when it was still 6,400 kilometers south of Asia, India hits the gas. I'm not kidding. The continent suddenly accelerates. It starts racing north at about 15, maybe 20 centimeters per year. Now, to you and me, that's nothing. But in geology, that is ludicrous speed. It's about twice as fast as the fastest modern tectonic drift we see anywhere on the planet today. And for years, scientists were completely baffled by this. It's a geological mystery. How, how can an entire continent just floor it? What was pushing it? Well, figuring that stuff out is exactly why we built this channel. To decode the hidden stories of our world. The things that are right in front of us, but we never knew how they got there. If you like this, if you're curious, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. It literally costs you nothing. And it tells YouTube we're doing something right. It means we get to keep making these. Okay, back to the runaway continent. So, what was the gas pedal? Well, geologists said MIT think they found the answer. And it's so cool. It's called double subduction. Okay, stick with me. This is easy. Think of a tectonic plate like it's on a giant conveyor belt, right? Most of the time, it's getting pulled by one edge that's sinking back into the Earth's mantle. That sinking edge is called a subduction zone. That's one engine. But what if it had two engines? The MIT team found relics of what may have been two subduction zones. India, way back then, was being pulled by two sinking plates at the same time. And what does two engines get you? Twice the pulling power. That's it. That's the gas pedal. A double engine that just floored it across the ocean. And as India was speeding north, it was closing this vast, ancient ocean called the Tethys Sea. Now, you might be thinking, an ocean? Where the Himalayas are? How do you know? because we found the bodies. No, seriously, we find marine fossils, the remains of sea creatures high in the Himalayan mountains. So as India is barreling north, all the mud and gunk and sediment at the bottom of that ocean, it just gets bunched up 
like earth in front of a plow. And then the crash. It wasn't a single event. The first kiss happened in the West around 55 million years ago, and the collision slowly zipped shut to the East, becoming a complete collision by 40 million years ago. This entire process, the initial contact in the West and the final zippering shut in the East, played out between 55 and 40 million years ago. This is the moment the Tethys Ocean closed for good, and the greatest mountain building of Ed on Earth began. But this, this was a hard collision. This was a continental plate hitting another continental plate. They're both thick, they're both buoyant, neither one could sink. So what happens? What happens when an unstoppable force, one that's been moving at record-breaking speed for millions of years, meets an immovable object? It has nowhere to go but up. The pressure was so immense, it contorted the collision zone, thrusting skyward to form the jagged Himalayan peaks. And here's the crazy part. It's still happening. The Indian plate is still moving northeast at 5 centimeters a year. But the Eurasian plate is only moving north at 2 centimeters a year. You could do the math. India is still smashing into Asia. It's still compressing and the Himalayas are still rising by about 5 millimeters every single year. This, this crash is everything. It's not just a backdrop. It's the author of India's story. That collision created the Himalayas. The Himalayas, he created a massive barrier. That barrier traps all the monsoon moisture coming from the south. And that created the great river systems. The Indus Basin in the west, the Ganges Brahmaputra Basin in the east. The Indus itself, along with its tributaries, forms the western and northern boundary of the Himalayas, starting in Tibet and flowing all the way to the Arabian Sea. The other rivers, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Yamuna, drain the rest of the massive basin. Without the crash, there are no mountains. Without the mountains, there are no rivers. Without the rivers, there's no fertile plain. And without that fertile plain, there's no civilization. So, the land is formed. Now, who arrives? We have to jump way back. The oldest artifacts ever found in the subcontinent, they come from places like the Shiwalik Range up in the north and a site called Atirapankam, way down in Tamil Nadu. Other major sites have been found all over, from Hunsgi in Karnataka to the Vindhya Range that separates the Ganges Basin from the Deccan Plateau. How old are we talking? We're in the Lower Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age. At Agarapankam, we're finding a whole toolkit, stone hand axes, cleavers, borers, and knives, all chipped from a quartzite rock that early humans carried from two to three kilometers away. And these weren't just rocks, these were tools. Archaeologists found hand axes, cleavers, borers, and knives, tools they would have used for everything, cutting meat, processing edible plants, working on wood and digging up tubers from the ground. And what we can tell is that these very first people were more gatherers than hunters, living out in the open, maybe making temporary shelters with twigs and hides. These early humans, like Homo erectus, were nomads, living a life that was entirely dependent on hunting and gathering. We see a huge leap forward, of course, the Neolithic or the New Stone Age. This is the big one. This is the invention of farming and settlement. This is the Neolithic Revolution, a total change from that hunter-gatherer lifestyle to one of settlement and domesticating animals. It's the moment we stopped chasing our food and started growing it. And in India, that revolution, that shift to farming and living in one place, leads directly to one of the largest, oldest, and most mysterious civilizations on Earth, the Indus Valley Civilization. Okay, so from about 3300 BCE, this civilization explodes across what is now Pakistan and Northwest India. And when I say civilization, I mean a civilization. This thing was massive. At its peak, may have had between one and five million people. Just to put that in perspective, the two main cities, uh, Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, might have had 30 to 60,000 people each. 
These were mega cities for the Bronze Age. Its cities, places like Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, were unbelievably advanced for their time. They had sophisticated urban planning. We're talking clusters of large non-residential buildings and sophisticated water supply systems. And get this, they built their cities with baked bricks, and all the bricks, whether big or small, were made using a standardized ratio of 1 to 2 to 4. They had a system of standardized weights for trade all across thousands of kilometers. This was a complex, organized, high-tech society. This wasn't just for show. The presence of bronze smithing kits all over the region suggests that these metal workers were a crucial part of society, not just some small elite. They were also masters of metallurgy, working with copper, bronze, lead, and tin. But that's just the stuff you can see. Their real masterpiece was something you'd never even see. It was hidden underground. Get this. The Indus Valley cities had the world's first known urban sanitation systems. I'm not talking about a ditch. I'm talking baked brick houses with individual wells for drawing water and covered drains that took wastewater from the homes to the main streets. This wasn't just for the rich. Even the smallest homes on the outskirts were connected. Here's the kicker. The researchers who studied this concluded their drainage was far more advanced than any found in contemporary urban sites, like in the Middle East, and even more efficient than those in many areas of Pakistan and India today. 5,000 years ago. Let that sink in. And that's not all. These guys were agricultural geniuses. We found evidence they were the first people to use complex multi-cropping strategies, growing both summer and winter crops. They found domesticated rice, millet, and tropical beans like rod and horse gram. This was a revolutionary strategy for mitigating risk from climate shifts. While Mesopotamia was relying on only winter crops like wheat and barley, and China was relying on only summer crops like rice, the Indus farmers were doing both. So were they just these brilliant, clean, isolated geniuses? Nope, not isolated at all. They had a vast maritime trade network. How do we know? Because we find their stuff thousands of miles away. We find Harappan seals, their distinctive jewelry, and their carnelian beads at archaeological sites in Mesopotamia, what is modern-day Iraq. We even find their clay seal impressions with the marks of the cords and sacks they used to bundle their goods. They were trading everything, timber, ivory, lapis lazuli, and gold, in exchange for silver, tin, and woolen textiles. And it wasn't just a small-time exchange. We're talking timber, precious woods, ivory, lapis lazuli, gold, carnelian beads, pearls, and shell and bone inlays going out, in exchange for silver, tin, woolen textiles, and even grain coming back. They were even importing copper ingots from a place called Magan, which is probably modern-day Oman. We even know what the Mesopotamians called them. Their texts from around 2350 BCE talk about trade with a place called Maluha. That was the Indus Valley. So let's just recap. By 2500 BCE, the people of India had massive planned cities, standardized bricks and weights, sanitation systems better than some we have today, a revolutionary multi-cropping agricultural system, and of course, they had writing. We found over 2,000 short inscriptions on these beautiful little seals. There are over 500 unique signs, and we know it was written from right to left, but nobody can read it. Not a single word. It's never been deciphered, and it's not for a lack of trying or a lack of evidence. We found over 2,000 short inscriptions. The script has over 500 unique signs, and we know it was written from right to left, but nobody can read it. A Finnish team, a Russian team, everyone has tried, and no one has cracked it. It remains one of the greatest linguistic puzzles in history. The origin of India is this incredible advanced 
urban civilization whose voice is silent. Well, almost silent. Many scholars believe there's a clue that the language might be an ancestor of the Dravidian languages, now spoken in southern India. There's even an isolated Dravidian language, Brahui, spoken in Pakistan today, geographically much closer to where the Harappans lived, which strengthens the case. Though other scholars argue the Dravidian family is just as indigenous to India as any other. A perfect setup for our next episode. So, India is an unstoppable force that crashed into an immovable object, and the story still isn't over. Its mountains are still rising, and its first cities are still holding their secrets. What did they believe? What did they write? We still don't know. But we do know what language family might be connected to them. And the story of how that language family fused with another is the key to understanding all of India. That's next time in part two, the origin of the language. What's the most mind-blowing fact you learned today? The double-engined continent? The 5,000-year-old plumbing? The multi-cropping? Let me know in the comments. And please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. See ya.